Let's shift the focus uh, back to your own work, uh, which focuses primarily on, I, I guess, on uh, uh, audiences response. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a bit about that, if you get involved, and how do you analyze audiences? Well, and it also, if you can, if you could make the distinction between users gratification and well, let me answer it back to Frank, because that let me start with the uses and gratifications distinction, because that's the easiest one. Um, I mean, I suppose for me, at the point at which I was beginning to think about audiences in 72, when I first... The first paper I ever wrote on audiences was called Reconceptualising the Audience, which was part of the, the Centre Stencil paper series. And I've got a book finally coming out next year, which has exactly the same title, but reconceptualising the audience, because I've spent all the intervening years trying to work on it. Uh, in a sense, the most important influence on that initial um, paper um, was the work of the language and class group. It was the critique of Bernstein, the attempt to deal with notions of cultural codes, the input from cultural anthropology, semiology in a sense, but a kind of social semiotics and so on and so forth. Now, at that point, uses and gratifications looked interesting insofar as at least it gave you some notion of an audience that was active, that was doing something, rather than just like kind of zomboid, having things happen to it. But I suppose for me, uh, uses and gratifications has always been fundamentally problematic on, on two separate counts. I mean, firstly, um, this notion of messages being kind of completely open to any kind of use that anybody wants to make of them, uh, frankly, I just think it, it, it is inadequate because I don't think uh, I, I don't think it's true. You know, of course, anybody can at a certain point read against the grain of a film or a program or whatever, but some readings are easier to make than others. You know, films are shot from the point of view of a hero or a heroine, like where the camera is positioned or whatever it is. Yeah, so. For me, I always, that's why I prefer Voloshinov's concept of multi-accentuality, which gives you a notion of a struggle over meaning, but a struggle between definite forces which are pulling the meaning of a word this way or that way, rather than the notion of polysemy in a kind of Bartesian usage, because for me, and a lot of that ends up back with the uses and gratifications, you know, from word to text, the idea that you can make anything out of anything. I just think that fails to deal with the way in which messages are structured by systems of control, ownership, and so on, which articulate themselves as professional practices. The second problem with uses and gratifications is insofar as it gives you a notion, the ability to deal with difference. It's only individual difference. Yes, it can deal with our, you know, the differences in the way in which you might see Godfather III as opposed to I might see it, qua kind of individuals, yeah? And Yes, of course, there'll always be those kinds of differences, but it doesn't allow you to say anything about cultural differences in senses in which we both, as white men, actually might tend to be involved in certain kinds of things and cultural codes and forms of cultural capital which other people would not share with us, or whatever, or our differences, as Canadian or English or whatever. So, for me, the crucial shift there was to, sh was to move away from a notion of individual differences of reading and to start to introduce a notion of cultural differences and cultural patternings of interpretation, which themselves, as a sociologist, I always want to locate by reference to social structure and social divisions. So, okay, so that's, that's the, the second part of your question, the what how would I talk about uses and gratification? How would I distinguish what I want to do from what that wants to do? Uh, the story of uh, the projects I've been involved in. Um, let's see. Well, okay, the first one, which was the nationwide uh, project, um, initially Stuart Hall and Ian Connell and I had been trying to get uh, money out of the ESRC in Britain to do a study of um, audience readings of television news as such. 
uh, like many of my experiences trying to get research money, those that attempt to get the thing together went on for ages and ages and ages. During that period at the centre, a new media group formed because of, kind of throughput of people, uh, including people like Charlotte Brunsden, Bob Lumley, uh, who were interested in a notion of popular television, um, who were wanting to kind of shift the focus away from this kind of hard news journalism focus, which so much media sociology is still wrapped up in. Yeah? Hence the decision that the media group made to focus on nationwide as a program, as a popular magazine program, rather than a serious news program. And that analysis was, 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 was made of, uh, of the program. And then Charlotte Brunston and I kind of wrote up what had been the group's uh, collective work. Um, so then we actually did have something with which to, to work. We actually had uh, a couple of videos of programmes that we were fairly confident that we got a reasonable analysis of and so that we are now in a position to start the audience research leg of, of, uh, 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 of the project. So um, I was able to set it up so that I could, I think in the end I showed the videos to 20 or 30 different groups of people and that was, I think, uh, uh, an interesting um, uh, set of findings, if we can call them that, in terms of like the differences between the ways in which members of those different groups read the same videotape. I mean, at the most fundamental level, I mean, I don't know if if you, if you ever saw the Nationwide program or if anybody here, but it's I mean, it'd be a very recognisable kind of early evening popular journalism, sort of with a domestic focus and sort of. It's all this thing about, uh, well, Chancellor so-and-so, your policy's all very well, but what will it mean in the supermarket? What will it mean in every, you know, yeah? Nationwide relentlessly did that. It was about ordinary families and the meaning of politics in everyday life. It was to do with, it had a certain kind of radical populist age, which was like to do with uh, undercutting politicians who attempted to use an abstract rhetoric, you know, bringing them down to earth. You know, what, what does it really mean? Yeah? So that's what was its project. And then, f well, I mean, for instance, uh, I, I'm showing this video in, uh, to, to a group of, of black students in East London at one point, and I've shown them the video, and I switch it off. I say, well, what do you make of that? And this girl speaks up, and the first thing she says is, uh, well, why don't they ever speak about ordinary families? All these people have got gardens. The very notion of ordinary family means something entirely different to her growing up in that, yes? And the way from what Nationwide imagined an ordinary family was about. That level of difference was a very interesting thing to explore when I was able to kind of uh, map the differences between the way in which a group of trainee bank managers as opposed to a group of trade unionists in a college interpreted the same program. You can begin to see some interesting things. but. One of the things that we wanted to do all the way through was to follow people from that situation into the home and to also do some work in the domestic setting because of funding problems, although the British Film Institute, to its credit, and to Ed Buscombe's credit in particular, had funded the project. They'd only been able to do so in a limited way, and we didn't have the money to do the domestic work. Retrospectively, that seemed to me to leave a kind of uh, significant uh, uh, blind spot in the project because I, I could see that people were beginning to use it in such a way when they referred to it as to imply, for instance, that the shop stewards who I'd interviewed making oppositional readings of television news programs were necessarily going to go home and make kind of, I don't know, progressive choices to watch late night subtitled Italian films rather than racist sitcom, which d simply doesn't follow at all. You know? So then I went, entered another kind of several years of negotiation before I finally got the uh, independent broadcasting authority to fund the family television project. Uh, and for me, I was in one sense working a kind of critical postscript to the nationwide project, trying to kind of reconstruct the, 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 the dimension of, of, of the domestic and to kind of look at television watching in its more kind of natural domestic setting. They're very well aware that in the nationwide, that 
thing. The methodology, in a sense, is quite artificial. I mean, groups of people in rooms not dissimilar from this, which just aren't the kinds of places people normally watch television. And, of course, what happened was that, uh, without really having thought it through very clearly in advance, I just walked into the issue of gender. You know, as soon as I started interviewing husbands and wives together, you know, it just became clear that gender was the kind of major organizing principle of difference. I mean, oh, what a surprise, tell me something new. And it's very curious, because as soon as I sort of said that, it seems terribly, terribly banal and obvious to me and to everyone else. But curiously enough, it didn't seem to be obvious before that somehow. It was this kind of weird, certainly not to me anyway. So with the family television thing, then it was, a, it was, it, It was an attempt to understand the household as a unit of consumption, to understand how differential gendered relations to domestic space and domestic leisure time actually produce fundamentally different ways of watching television. Like, I mean, the, you know, the clearest example is, woman, tell me about your favorite television programs when you're watching television, you know, and she starts to list these programs. And after a few minutes, she stops herself and says, oh, do you mean sitting down watching? Because for her, sitting down watching is a kind of minor subcategory of watching. Watching television for her is actually listening to television on the whole from the kitchen or as she's going around the house and seeing to the kids or doing the washing up or whatever. And that's a very banal story, but I think it's a, it's a very fundamental story about uh, differential relations to domestic space as determinants of differential gendered patterns of viewing behavior, which I think is crucial, which I certainly hadn't figured through in advance, and I certainly do think that I came away from that study feeling that yeah, that was of, of, of enormous uh, uh, importance. But I suppose at the same time, um, I'd begun also to be interested in um, beginning to think about television in a, in a broader sense, not just in the broader context of domestic consumption, but television in relation to other kinds of communications technologies as well. And then uh, I was able uh, to, to pursue that when I moved to, to Brunel and began to work uh, with Roger Silverstone, who by that time had managed to get ESRC funding for a study of the household uses of information and communication technology, which he and I and Sonia Livingstone and Eric Hirsch have spent, whatever it is, three years uh, working on. And I suppose the thing about that is um, it takes that interest in television, but it decenters the notion of television is necessarily the central medium. It begins to think about radio. We've been as interested in the telephone or the computer as we've been in the television. We've also, because of the advantages of having uh, substantial funding in this case, been able to work in a quite different way. When I did the family television study, I was working on my own and I had only the opportunity to interview each couple once so I perhaps had a three-hour visit to their house. And I was amazed how much it was possible to get in one three-hour visit, frankly. I mean, it all starts off like again and again as a sort of um, uh, let's present the researcher with a kind of collaborative facade of our relationship. And, of course, it cracks up. You know, there's a moment where the guy's saying, yes, I always watch the nature programs, and I like to watch the science programs, and, of course, I always watch the news. And you can see his wife looking at him going, and finally she says, you like Bilko, or something, yes? You know, like kind of, people begin to kind of, you know, undercut each other's pretenses. I mean, doubtless you get conned as well at the moment. However, nonetheless, it was like one three-hour visit. Because we had uh, so much more funding for, the, for the, the, the study at Brunel, we've been able to spend, like, you know, hours with people. We've been on kind of multiple visits. We've had them do diaries. We've watched television with them. We've talked to their kids. We've been back. We've sat with them while they fiddle with the computer. You get a whole different and much more complex read on kind of the place of communications technologies in the household, just when you're able to kind of hang around that much longer. Simple kind of anthropological sort of field work. Um, of course, you then get the problem because you've got all this data, you know. 
you've got these shelves of like transcripts and stuff, which you know I'm terrified are going to fall over and bury us at some point. And I, you know, I'm only partly metaphorical there. Uh, so I mean, we began to work on that stuff, which begins to deal with kind of, I suppose in part, it's like a sort of query raised against a technologically determinist notion of information and communication technologies transforming society or transforming the family. Because what we've done is turn the question round and look at the question of how differences in family structure and family culture affect the differential perception of the salience of communications technologies and affect the differential take-up and use of communications technologies. Now, again, that's not to say anybody can do anything they like with any technology to get back to the uses and gratifications model. You know, precisely what we're interested in is how people work with the stuff in the context of the preferred readings of, which have been produced precisely through marketing and design and advertising, you know, the home computer or whatever else. But we have been very interested in, as it were, that kind of symbolic dimension of objects. So, I mean, like to take the home computer. You know, in Britain, we had a year of information technology in 1982, I think it was, which the British economy was going to be saved by information technology. Everybody had to get a home computer. And of course, if you go around now, you dis you discover that like 75% of the home computers that were bought are back in their boxes, under the stairs, out of the way, because like nobody could ever think of anything to do with them once they got them. And I think you can make quite a strong anthropological argument about you know computer acquisition as strictly a totemic proposition. That what you had was like you know, I have the totem of the future in my house. The deities are pacified. My children will be saved, rather than any kind of rational purposive calculation of what you're going to do with it. That's interesting territory, I think. One of the things we began to get onto was this notion of technology and boundary. Clearly, we were interested in the relation between the private and the public, between the family and the nation. The role of information and communication technologies, both in articulating those spheres together, but as soon as you say that, of course, also in transgressing boundaries. Yeah? So, I mean, I'll give you one sort of, uh, an example of, of, of some of the issues that arose with one particular uh, family. Um, the husband had just been made um, unemployed. The family is becoming very worried about um, its finances and there's a family rule that the children can only receive rather than make phone calls. Perfectly straightforward, it seems. But then we talked to the teenage girl, and it turns out that her father is actually um, uneasy, even when her friends call her in the evenings rather than her calling them. So it's not simply an economic problem. There's, some th there's a cultural rule at stake here about the privacy of the household or the unity of the household. Now, it gets you back to the, all those questions like, what do you do? What, you know, what's the significance of a telephone answering machine? It can be used in different ways, you know, either to connect or to disconnect as a barrier or as an including device, depending on how it's used in the family. What we began to think about uh, coming out of that, and which I've then worked on um, with uh, Kevin Robbins and, uh, to some extent, with Ian Ang, is a set of questions which take us from there. I mean, if my work has gone from, like, the public stuff with ideology and the news media and nationwide down into a kind of domestic focus with family television and further into that domestic process of consumption in the household study, although broadened to a greater range of technologies, What's interesting to me is uh, it's partly a publishing question, but certainly it seems both here and in, in the States, the work of mine that people know is the family television book. They think, oh, morally domestic consumption. Whereas for me, that's a kind of necessary detour on a longer route. It's not, as it were, the point in itself. What I'm interested in doing is connecting those sets of issues about domestic consumption to a rather broader set of questions about uh, cultural identity, national identity, electronic space, community, 
and the transformations of those things that have been worked, certainly in Europe, very dramatically at the moment, with things like satellite television and so on. So what I suppose I've begun to try to do is, I mean, I suppose I'd argue that those sort of generalized perspectives on, I don't know, postmodern culture or something, which have very little reference to an understanding of the processes of domestic consumption, to me, if they're ungrounded in that respect, they're really of, of very little interest. But conversely, if one just got more and more involved in a kind of study of, of however sophisticated of the processes of micro-consumption without reference to those broader themes, ultimately that too would lose interest for me. It's precisely the question of how to articulate those kind of micro and macro issues in relation to things like, certainly what I perceive as, the kind of simultaneous kind of logic of, of, uh, of globalization and localization at the, in the way that, like, Paddy Scannell talks about the role of the broadcast media in the socialization of the private sphere. I think you have to see that as part of a kind of double process, which is also the domestication of that public sphere. Yeah? Those are the questions which, for me, uh, are now of interest, and that's, that's, that's really what I'm trying to pursue.